Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so maybe one of us can please lead in prayer. Go ahead. Anybody can lead. Vijay, would you like to lead? Heavenly, thank you, thank you for this day that we are going to God. Lord, thank you for this moment, Lord. Lord, as we are reading the scriptures, Lord, Lord give us that we understand everything. Lord, um, keep everything in our hearts, Lord. In, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about uh, the covenants, the cross. We also talked a lot about the blood and what the blood of Jesus did in the new covenant and uh, how he, you know, the old covenant talks about the Passover lamb and in the new covenant, uh, the blood that was shed, the cross um, was was the, the picture of the Passover lamb that happened in the old covenant. Uh, but then we also talked about how the glory of the new covenant is greater with greater blessings. It's an everlasting covenant. Uh, the blood of Jesus is much greater, much stronger than that of the old covenant. So uh, let's get into this chapter on chapter 24, the Lord's table. And this is a very interesting chapter. We should be able to finish uh, the portions today um and uh you know this is a very important chapter the lord's table let's look at uh you know as believers what is the lord's table you know at here at our church uh at apcb we partake in the lord's table every sunday but maybe in your uh local churches you may be doing it once or twice in a month uh, but what is the significance of the lord's table we don't see any of it in the old covenant uh you know when the Lord Jesus was having his last meal with his disciples, he used this opportunity to announce that he is establishing a new covenant. Right? Uh, uh, this, this new covenant was uh, the Lord's table is a proclamation of Christ's death, burial, and his resurrection. Right? So uh, this is a token or a sign of the blood covenant that God established for us. Now, in the old covenant, the, the, the blood covenant was established. But here, in the new covenant, he's establishing it with his own blood. So he's talking to the disciples. He's telling them, hey, this is what is going to happen. Of course, they did not believe at first. But uh, when he's telling them, this is my body, this is my blood, they may not have understood. But now you and I understand, and maybe, and later on, even the disciples understood that what he did was he was doing away with the old, and he was establishing a new covenant. Let's look at First Corinthians, uh, chapter eleven, uh, verse seventeen through thirty-four. Now, before we read this, let me give you a little bit of context. It's there uh, on the notes. Now, the Corinthian church was a spiritual church. A church that was speaking in tongues, it were, they were prophesying, there was word of knowledge, there was gifts of the spirit, very spiritual church compared to the other churches. But there was one problem, not one, there were plenty of problems, but one of the problems was the Lord's table. What was happening was they forgot the reverence of the Lord's table, so they would come to church, they would eat the bread, they would drink the you know the cup the wine uh, they would make it like a you know enjoying festival like a you know like a feast uh, they lost the reverence of the lord's ta table signifying the lord jesus's death and resurrection so basically what the corinthian church did they made it like a time of fellowship a time of you know probably they were uh, you know, chatting with each other, talking to each other while they're having the Lord's table. Now, the Apostle Paul heard about this. So he writes this letter and he says this. Okay, so we've got that whole portion there. First Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. I'll read it. Now, in giving these instructions, I, did, I do not praise you 
since you come together not for the better but for the worst. First of all, when you all come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I did not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed. And when he took given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Verse 27, therefore, now he's giving them instructions. Therefore, whoever eats and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So these words are quite stern from the Apostle Paul, and he's bringing this whole emphasis on this disorder during communion. He says, now, you are coming together as a church, you are partaking in the Lord's table, but not doing it in an orderly, orderly manner, not honoring God. Now, instead of receiving the blessings of the cross, what is happening is the Corinthian believers are opening their lives to the work of the enemy, and what, they, what is supposed to be sacred, they are putting themselves in a place of judgment. So what is the result of that? Many of them are sick, many of them are weak, many of them are dying premature deaths. But it's, it's, it's gone entirely reversed. Jesus said, do this, and the blessings of the cross will come upon you. But the Corinthian believers are doing it the wrong way. And instead of blessing, they're opening their life to the work of the enemy. So this is a very important lesson for us. When we are partaking in the Lord's table, you know, the, this verse says here, uh, you know, we need to think about the message translation says, ponder your thoughts as you partake in the Lord's table, right? Ponder on your life. So even as we hold the Lord's table in our hand, uh, we're partaking in the Lord's table, ponder, think about your life, think about what the Lord Jesus did for you and me, and then partake. Remember, his resurrection power, we are proclaiming his resurrection power. It begins to flow in and through us. Right? We can expect healing. We can expect the blessings of the cross. Right? Every dominion, every power of the enemy, every addiction, every oppression, every fear, guilt, shame, whatever is trying to hinder us and block us, everything can be nullified when we partake in the Lord's table. Why? Because we are proclaiming the blessings of the cross over our lives. Now, what happens when we take it in a disorderly manner, in a dishonoring manner? We are inviting sickness. We are inviting uh, you know, the work of the enemy into our life because we're not honoring. Right? 
Uh, and that's what happening here to the Corinthian believers. What is the purpose of the Lord's table? The purpose of the Lord's table is so that we proclaim, you know, what Christ has done for us. It's a sacred celebration. It is an experience of receiving. We're opening ourselves and saying, Lord Jesus, I believe in your body. I believe in your blood. Now those that, you know, the, the grape juice and the bread was probably made just somewhere in some shop close by. There's nothing, you know, holy about it. But the moment we, you know, we take these elements and we say, I believe this to be the body and the blood of Jesus. I identify with the work that Jesus did on the cross. There is resurrection power. Right? There is power in that. It can just be normal. Right? You, know, you can also take you know, at, uh, you can take a piece of bread, you can take water, say, Lord, I believe that this is your body and this is your blood. I'm partaking of this, uh, you know, I'm partaking of this, remembering the cross, there is resurrection power in that. We are proclaiming our faith in the work of the cross. We are proclaiming that Jesus has established the covenant. He's going to come again to fulfill everything that he has said in the new covenant right and we are we are proclaiming that on the cross jesus paid for our sins so we are in right standing with god the power of sin is broken so we are free from the dominion of sin we have jesus has removed every sickness he has paid every punishment he has removed the curse of the law the power of satan has been destroyed and we are redeemed, which means we have been purchased by God. Right? Uh, one drop of the blood of Jesus is able to destroy everything that the enemy has set out to do. Just one drop. Right? This is, I'm sure we've all heard that song, right? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. It's not just a song, it is, it is true. It's the drop of the blood of Jesus. It can just wipe away every sin, every work of the devil can be destroyed. So imagine the cup we drink, it brings blessings into our life. The bread we eat, we remember the body that was you know, beaten and bruised on the cross. And we are proclaiming uh, that he has finished the work for us. So what can you and I do? Later on, Paul says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Right? So we can partake every day. We can partake, uh, you know, and when we believe it, we can partake of it. Uh, and when we partake of it, we can expect the work of the Holy Spirit to be manifested in each of our lives. Right. Uh, so I want to encourage each one of us, you know, even as we partake this, let's not, you know, dishonor the Lord's table. Right. Now, I want to make this point. There are times we sin and there are times we do things wrong and we have failed. Let it not stop you from partaking in the Lord's table. Right. See, when when we when we partake in the Lord's table, but also identifying with what he's done on the cross. All our sins are paid for. So sometimes the enemy may make us feel guilty. Oh, you're such a sinner. You did so many things wrong, Monday to Friday, and now on Sunday you want to take the Lord's table. Sometimes we feel guilty. We say, I don't want to partake of this. I'm not worthy. No, you are worthy. Because the price that was paid was for you and for me. And so all we need to do is we say, God, I have sinned. I've turned my face against you. I've sinned against you. But I know that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. So I'm going to partake in this, what you have commanded us, knowing that you will forgive my sins, that the curse and the dominion of sin over my life is broken. That's the attitude that we come into. right? Because many times I've heard you know, people ask me, 
I've sinned. Can I partake in the Lord's table? Yes. And the Lord Jesus very plainly said, uh, you know, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. Right? So we are partaking to, to identify with what he did on the cross. So it's it's good that we do it. Rather than running away from it, you can say, God, I'm running to you. I'm running to the cross. I'm going to partake uh, of what you have asked me to do. Now, what happens when we are dishonoring the Lord's table? Right? Uh, uh, you know, the church in Corinth was, they were blatantly, what was, you know, sacred. They have made it a time of feasting, of enjoying, and there's no focus on one's own life. They were not looking at the Lord's table as a place where we are to be, you know, thankful for what Jesus did on the cross and what happened. Few things happened. One, there was a withdrawal of divine protection. Right? Uh, God was God was beginning to you know bring judgment on both on what on all of them in the church. He took off his hand of protection. That's a serious thing. Two, God permitting or engaging weakness, sicknesses sickness and premature death to get people's attention to in order to bring us back to the right path this is not god's will but what happens when we step out of god's design and walk in disobedience we are opening our lives to the enemy right if you, if you read second corinthians um, you know many of them uh, paul writes and he says I hear that there are many of them who are going through sickness and, and there is there is death and there is uh, there is lack, there is no blessings. And he tells them, it is because of this. You have opened your life to judgment and the way that you all have... Uh, you no, know, this is one of the reasons. Because the Corinthian church had division, there was, there was pride, there was, uh, you know, they were questioning his apostleship. Uh, and, and so God permitted these things. As believers, you and I don't need to fear weakness. We don't have to fear sickness, premature death, because uh, we are not participating in the Lord's table in a wrong manner. Right? We, we, we must partake in reverence. The Holy Spirit empowers us and forces us. Uh, everything the Lord Jesus instituted for us. Right? So even as we partake, uh, let's be mindful of it right now. Uh, I know that in rural churches, in churches and villages, you know, many of them say that you know you uh, you must cover your hair, you must take out your sandals. Now it may some of you, some of them, it may be a culture shock looking at us. You know, we are not covering our hair; we are wearing our shoes. Now we must understand the the context of what Paul is, you know, why he said to them to cover their, you know, the hair, and why he says, um, you know, why we need to remove our footwear and all of that. So we'll talk about that another time. But um, it's more about the heart. Right? Uh, but if in your in your churches that is a custom, go ahead and do that. Right? You don't have to. You know, say no. I will not do it. The, you know, it's more about the heart. God is seeing my heart. No, it's okay. If that is something that you do in the church, that's what the church follows. Do it. Uh, you know, we go out on missions, and when we go to churches, they ask us if we can remove our footwear. We remove our footwear. We don't say no. You know, we don't start giving uh, hermeneutics there. It's not required. Right? Uh, just be culturally sensitive. Uh, next, the cup and the bread. 1 Corinthians 10, 15 through 18, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. 
are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. Now, Paul is recognizing that he's speaking to wise people and invites them to think. Now, Corinth is in Greece. Greece is known for its intellect. Acts 17 talks about, you know, he, when Paul goes into Aeropagus and he's giving this wonderful sermon, they were all learned people. Right? They were all intellectual people, very wise people, you know. Greece is known for its philosophy, its study, for its uh, uh, libraries, that were there for its different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scientific studies that they have. So Paul knows, hey, these are all learned people, right? So he's he's revealing to us, Paul reveals to us, spiritual significance of the Lord's table, which we partake together as believers he's saying he's using the greek word koinonia which is fellowship sharing partnership and he's saying it's a cup of blessings it is this cup when we drink of it we are intending the blessings of god to come into our life and when we bless it and drink it we can we can respond in faith we can receive what god wants us to receive Right. And when we say this communion of the body of Christ, it is remembering the body that was bruised on the cross. Uh, and we are also sharing or being part of his spiritual body, the church. Right. So, very important, the cup and the bread, the Lord's table must be done in an honor, honorable manner. No, I know that you know during these these times that we live in, um, there are so many distractions. And one of the things that I would always tell people is, you know, I've noticed this, but um, we can connect in a loving way. Right? One of the things I've noticed is, you know, during the Lord's table, uh, sometimes people will be on the phone. Right? Uh, now. It's, it's not a wise thing to do. Why? Because, see, it's just a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes, partaking the Lord's table. You can put aside the... Five minutes. It is... You're honoring what you're doing. You're honoring the Lord. You're honoring you know, the price that He paid on the cross. It's such a valuable thing. Right? So... Um, you know, even as much as possible. Just it's a time where we set things right before God, and uh, and that way we are opening ourselves to the blessings of God. Then Paul goes on to talk about idols and sacrifices. First Corinthians ten nineteen to twenty four. What am I saying there? That an idol is nothing, anything. Sorry, that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke you to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now, here's what's happening. We've got believers in the Corinthian church. They are partaking in the Lord's table. Now, there were also idols. Now, in Corinth, there was, uh, you know, it, it's known for its temples and it had... Uh, you know, thousands of temple prostitutes, male and female prostitutes, sacrifices were made to these uh, in these temples to these gods. Now, here, what he's what he's saying is, they're partaking in the Lord's table, but they're also partaking in the food that is sacrificed to idols. Right. So Paul is really upset. He's saying. How can you, as a believer, you're partaking in the Lord's table, the cup of the Lord, but you're also partaking in the cup of the devil? Because an idol is nothing. 
But what is behind that idol are spirits of demonic forces that are working. And we cannot mix true worship and idol worship. When we're partaking in the Lord's table, it is true worship unto the Lord. But the moment we partake in food sacrificed to idols, we're also partaking in the cup of the enemy, cup of the devil. This is unacceptable and this must not happen. And that's why Paul is uh, saying, you're provoking the Lord's jealousy. The Lord loves us. He cares for us. He's done this for us. But when we are partaking of both the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demon, cannot be mixed. Right? Uh, so he's saying, uh, there are some things that are lawful, meaning culturally accepted. In the in the culture of Corinth, it was okay. You partake in Lord's table, you partake, you eat also the food sacrificed to idols, no problem. It was culturally accepted. But then Paul is saying, hey, we must think, we must evaluate. Are these things helping us? Are these things building us up? Is it honorable in the eyes of God? Is it something that is, uh, you know, that God has, uh, you know, asked me to do? Is it acceptable? Or am I just doing this on popular opinion or because everyone are doing it, I'm doing it. So maybe that was what was happening in the Corinthian church. Partaking in the Lord's table, there is food sacrifice to idols. They are partaking in that as well. So he's saying, now, culturally, nobody may say anything to you. Right? Uh, it's acceptable, culturally. But if you think about it, you evaluate, is it spiritually edifying and building you up? No. It's only opening doors for us, for the enemy to come and work in our lives. Now, the idol is nothing. The idol is nothing. It's just made of stone. In the book of Jeremiah, he talks about it. You know, you go into the forest, you cut the tree, you make a shape, you adorn it with gold, silver. It has eyes, it does not see. It has ears, it does not hear. It has a mouth, it cannot speak. It, you, it, it's nothing. But we are partaking in the, the demons that are working behind those idols. And so Paul is strictly saying, don't partake of the cup of the Lord and also partake in the cup of demons. Now, how do we translate it to us in the generation that we are in? Right? We partake in the Lord's table. Now, for example, you know, you go to the corporate, you're in the corporate sector, or uh, or you know there's a feast of another faith, and they come and they give you something to eat. Right? Now you can politely decline it and say. No, I'm, uh, no, thank you. Uh, of course, you wish them, say, you know, and then you politely say, no, thank you. I would rather not have it. Right? Uh, or you know that this is something that has been sacrificed or it's been prayed over by, you know, for the idols. Very politely decline it. Nothing wrong. You know, in the times that we are living in, we, we can. Many times when I was in the corporate sector, people you know, for all these fees, they would come and say, hey, why don't you do it? Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to. I don't want to. In, you know, I know that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and I don't want to open my life to the works of the enemy. Is it fear? It's not fear. It's being wise. Right? It's being wise. How can I partake in the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons? Now, when you go to the marketplace, like if you're going to you know buy meat from the market, right? Uh, we don't know whether it has been sacrificed to any idols or it was just you know uh, it doesn't matter. You buy it, you come, you, you cook it, you pray over it, and you eat it. Now you can't do internal research you know, with the government. Oh, where did this go? Where did, where all did it went? Did it go to any temples? You can't do all of that. Okay, it's practically not possible. But in places that you know that it has intentionally been prayed over, uh, you know, on sacrifice to idols, stay away from it. Right? Uh, things that we must consider in this matter 
is the Apostle Paul has addressed the issue of idols and eating things offered to idols. He says we cannot mix the worship of God and the worship of demons. It may be culturally ex acceptable, but it may not be helpful or edifying. I also need to consider the other person's well-being, meaning, uh, you know, even, if, even when I say no, I need to politely say no. And then you may get an opportunity to, you know, to share, or sometimes they may just ridicule and mock you, but it's okay. You can, uh, you know, you're, you're setting your priorities, right? You're saying, God, no, this is what you want me to do. So, uh, so yeah, especially the nation that we are living in, in India, uh, we have many people from many other faiths, uh, different, you know, festivals and different pro, you know, uh, kinds of idols and there's so much happening around us. Uh, we can politely say no. And we're honoring God in that. But, uh, now, Paul is not saying, you know, only if you're strong in the Lord, you have it, right? Only if you're 10 years in the Lord, only if you're 20 years. He's not saying any of it. He's saying, I cannot mix the worship of God, the worship of demons together. Stay away from it. Right? So, uh, so that marks the end of that chapter. Let's get into what the blood of Jesus does for us. We'll quickly look at this. I know we've talked a lot about it. Uh, maybe some of it is a repeat, uh, but we'll just quickly go over it and then we'll be able to finish our portions uh, in this class itself, right? Okay, any questions about uh, the Lord's table and food sacrifice to idols? Uh, we'll be learning more on this in detail um, in the third years we'll be doing uh, first and second Corinthians uh, verse, and verse by verse uh, study. Uh, right. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Stay away from food sacrifice to idols, right? Uh, just remember that you're partaking in the cup of the Lord. Stay away from that, right? Okay. What the blood of Jesus does for us. Now, we talked about how the cross um, affects our life, right? Um, uh, how the cross affects our living. The, now, it's almost everything is applicable even to what the blood of Jesus did is doing for us. By right? the blood of Jesus, uh, we are redeemed from the fall through the blood of Jesus. Our relationship with God is, has been changed. Uh, uh, through the blood of Jesus, we are always victorious. We operate from a place of authority and dominion in our conflict with the devil. So what does the blood of Jesus do for us? It cleansed us from all sins. We are sanctified by the blood of Jesus. We are justified, reconciled to God. We are brought near to God. Uh, we are cleansed from every dead works, cleansed from every evil, guilt, shame. We are protected by the blood of Jesus. You know, when we pray, what do we say? Uh, I cover this house with the blood of Jesus. I cover this family with the blood of Jesus. Now, it's not like we know, right? It's, it's, it's a spiritual thing. Uh, it's like we're saying uh, there's a blood covering and we're thinking about the passover right where the lamb blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost and death just passed by so the blood of jesus we're covering it we're sealing it with the blood of jesus and there is power in that uh, we're redeemed uh, from our wicked way of life we overcome the enemy revelations 12 11 says you overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So anytime the enemy is attacking our mind, you say, I speak the blood of Jesus around my mind, my thoughts. Uh, if you feel uh, if the enemy is attacking your body, you say, I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. Uh, I speak healing in the blood of Jesus. I speak forgiveness and through the blood of Jesus. These are things that we can declare. Yeah. Finally, um, uh, it says we are clothed in in robes of white, meaning the blood of Jesus has cleansed us uh, uh, from all unrighteousness. Right. So the same the same things what the cross has done for us, the same things uh, the blood 
does for us. The blood speaks. This blood, blood is still powerful. And so we can apply it in our lives. Right. Uh, Nina and Anand, uh, I think you've raised your hands. you have any question? Yes, uh, Nina and Anand, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, okay. uh, no, you go ahead, Anand, after you. Um, Father, it's me, Rin. So I have a question about the Lord's table. Um, so, um, um, uh, so I go to this church and... Uh, from there, my uh, pastor, he said this, like, um, if you have any sickness or if you're uh, suffering from anything, um, take the uh, keep on taking the communion until you um, receive healing or, or, you see, or until you see the manifestation of the healing. And uh, so I was doubting about this. I had a question on this. So what do you say about it? Okay. So the Bible says that by his stripes we are healed, right? So we partake in the Lord's table, but we don't partake only to receive healing. So our mind should not be like, okay, I'll take the Lord's table every day till I receive my healing. Then what does it become? It becomes a formula, right? We, I can pray and say, Lord, by your stripes I am healed and I receive my healing. I can receive my healing, right? It's not like I have to partake in the Lord's table, only then I will receive healing. No, this is one of the ways that the Lord Jesus has one of the you know means where the Lord Jesus has given us to uh, partake of. And through this, we receive his healing. So even if we partake in the Lord's table, if we don't receive healing, doesn't mean it's not powerful. I can be praying somewhere, I can be driving the car and say, by the blood of Jesus, by your stripes, Lord, I'm healed and receive healing immediately. And, uh, on the flip side, if I'm, if I'm praying and praying and taking communion every day and I don't receive healing, it should not stop us from taking communion. Hey, this is not powerful. It's been one year, I have not received healing. So you gotta be very careful. Right? You can never say, you can never say, no, only if I take this, I will be healed. No. What does the Bible say in Deuteronomy? He sent his word and healed my disease. And, uh, so what I would say to this is, when continue to partake, right? When we partake in the Lord's table, there are so many blessings that come our way. Continue to partake. Continue to trust God. But it's not a formula where you say, only when I keep taking the Lord's table, I'll receive healing. No, it's not a formula. You can receive your healing just by praying, just by declaring in faith. And uh, so I hope that answers your question. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, Nina, go ahead. Yeah, um, sorry about, uh, I mean, a little earlier, I thought I would just ask you something. That's why I had opened, I had unmuted. I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, about the uh, things offered to idols. While we were looking at the uh, fact that the idol is nothing and there is, uh, I mean, there's it, it has no significance. At the same time, when what is offered to the idol, if we take it, then we kind of partake in what it signifies. So when there are these instances when uh, people, okay, friends or whoever of the other faiths, uh, when they send something sometimes, you know, which we invariably know that has been offered, I mean, not in front of them, in front of them, okay, if we can kind of get, if they say that it is so, then it's scripture says that we should refrain from you mm -hmm. taking it. So what I'm saying is when, uh, when there is no one, but then still, because we know there is this, is it bet, isn't it better, or is it better to refrain from having anything to do with that, whatever is offering, whatever is offered to the idols, 
in spite of the fact that we know that it's nothing, but still. Yeah. What do so, you yeah. so I, I suggest to just uh, you know politely say no. That's what I suggest. See, because what happens is it could have been yes. played in front of. See, we're not talking out of a place of fear. Firstly, you know, yes. so it's not like it's not like oh, what will happen to me? No. See, God has given us power, but He's also given us wisdom, right? Uh, so they both go together: power and wisdom. Right? Only power will destroy us. Only wisdom and no power also is not going to do any good, right? So, one, we know that it is. Offer to idols, we just politely say no. But you know, for example, there's a feast that happened yesterday, and somebody comes and gives you, your friend comes and gives you, uh, and you know that, hey, yesterday was the feast, and, uh, but they may not say it was prayed over and all of it. But I would just say, hey, no, thank you. Or, or if they insist, you can take it, maybe give it to somebody else. Uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to partake of it. Or you, know, you can just refrain. You can just say politely, "No." Uh, I'm sure they'll understand. It's better to refrain. Let's say. Okay. All right. So there's a last portion here, 26. How we receive, experience, and enforce the power of the blood. Right. Uh, we talked about this. How do we enforce the power of the cross? How do we experience the power of the cross? Uh, most of it is the same. Experiencing the blood of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus. John 6, 53 to 57, Then Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. One of the important ways that we can experience the blood of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus in our life, is by embracing and knowing that the blood of Jesus was the blood of the Son of God. Knowing that he, the, the blood was precious blood, sinless blood that was shed on the cross. We embrace it by faith. Where is the blood? People may ask, where is the blood? And I cover with the blood of Jesus. Well, what blood? Where is the blood? It is a spiritual thing. We embrace it by faith. Right? Hebrews 11, 28, by faith he kept the Passover at the sprinkling, sprinkling of the blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Hebrews 11 talks about how the Lord Jesus, after he finished his, uh, when he rose again from the dead, he went to heaven and he's talking about uh, there's this distinction between the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly tabernacle and the uh, uh, earthly high priest and the heavenly high priest. We looked at that difference. The earthly high priest goes in every year, but the heavenly high priest went once for all and shed his, you know, he he poured out his blood, remembering, uh, you know, all that was done in the Old Testament. He did it once for all. So we receive and walk in this covenant of grace through, in obedience and faith. And we must fight for our covenant rights because there is an enemy who wants to rob us. Believe in the blood of Jesus. Declare what the blood of Jesus has done for you. Right? We testify. We declare it with our mouth. Uh, we say, right, like how we say, talk about the cross and talk about what Jesus did for us. We declare what the blood of Jesus has done for us. Uh, and the blood of Jesus is a weapon that we can use against the enemy. And then finally, we welcome the work of the Holy Spirit, even as we declare what the blood has done for us. Right. So with this, we come to a close on this entire course. Uh, and I pray that each one of us will truly walk in this understanding. We are partakers of a new covenant. 
We are partakers of the cross. We are partakers of the blood of Jesus. And every day of our lives, there must be a renewing. We go back to God and say, God, I'm part of your covenant. I believe what you have done for the cross on the cross for me. Oh, and I believe the price that you paid for me. And we talked about you know so many wonderful aspects, this divine exchange that the Lord established through this. Right? So any questions, any thoughts, uh, even as we've come to the close of this entire course? Any questions? All right. All right. So uh, thank you so much for joining along this entire course. I really enjoyed uh, you know, the studying and teaching this course. Uh, thank you all for being part of this course. Uh, uh, let's just close in prayer. And uh, soon I'll put up the final uh, term assessments so you can uh, go online uh, on the Google Classrooms and then you can do your assessments. All right. Shall we close in prayer? Uh, maybe uh, I'll close, I'll pray and close. And let's thank God for this entire semester. And let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful day and this wonderful course that we've been able to study together. Lord, we pray that we will, each one of us, learn and grow and know, Lord, that who we are in you, that we are blessed, we are your children. We are partakers of a new covenant, and we pray, God, that we will walk in this authority, we will walk in this understanding of God. I pray for each and every student. I pray that you bless them, you fill them with your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That, Lord, even as they study, they prepare themselves for the things that they have to do. I pray, God, that you will release your anointing upon their lives, God. Use each, the, each one of them greatly for your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for being with us throughout this entire semester, this entire course, Lord. We surrender everything that we have learned, everything that we have studied, oh God, may be a seed in our heart to bear fruit in our lives, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful semester. The meaning of the semester. Have a great uh, week ahead. I'll I'll see you next semester. God bless you. Have a good break. Thank you so much. Welcome.